This is the sequence we're taking. We're going to add these two registers together, R2 and R3, and produce a parquet in R1. Then we're going to load from memory of that address into another register, R4. And then we're going to overwrite R1 with this, this constant 27. So the front end um, generates, translates e each instruction individually. So for example, for this add instruction, we have three temporaries, T10, 11, and 12. Are we going to fetch the register state, um, and these numbers are these offsets in that um, struct on the previous slide? It's completely arbitrary offsets, but it has to be connected to the structure somehow. Then we're going to um, add them together, producing another temporary, and then we're going to park the results back in the um, slot for um, the destination register, R1. So that's the end of that. So load is very similar. We're going to fetch um, R1 again. Going to actually do the load and then put the result back in the result register in its slot. And finally, we're going to um, overwrite R1 with this value 27. So we're just going to take the literal 27 and put it in the slot for R1. So. This is then put through the intermediate representation optimizer, which does a whole bunch of things. But one of the things that's most important is it chains the gets and the puts together. So it's going to take this fetch here and observe that the value is actually written further up. So it's just going to hook this up to like that. So now we're loading from T12, which is just what we've computed up there. And we also observe that um, we um, are overwriting this offset 4 in the guest state. So put 4 here and put 4 there. So this, this put is actually redundant. So uh, this is actually quite a, a, a weak example, but it shows that um, you kind of optimize so that you remove some of the artifacts in the original IR. <coughs> and just for the hell of it, I'm going to show um, generating x86 code from the um, IR, even though we put ARM in, in the pipeline to start with. So Valgrind never actually operates in a cross-architecture mode, but it was kind of designed, so that you, at least originally, so that you could do that if you really wanted to. So we're going to have, we decided that we're going to have the EBP register pointing at the um, <coughs> the guest state here. So for these two fetches of the guest state, we're loading these two x86 registers. 
then we're going to add them together. And I mean, it's pretty, it's really sp straightforward tr um, translation. Then we're going to load from ECX into there, and then we're going to put these two values for um, R4 and R1 back in the guest state. So the good thing about this is that we've um, managed to hold in, in, in this register ECX the value of R1, I think it is, across multiple guest instructions at the front of the pipeline. Um, but there is a kind of a, a downside to, to this as well, which becomes more obvious as the blocks get longer. So here we have, uh, we're, we're reading values out of the guest state into the um, host registers. And at the other end of the block, we're putting values from the host registers back into the guest state, back into memory, back into our structure. The effect of this is that um, there are no registers live across the end of the block boundary. And it makes the compiler simple, but it generates a huge amount of extra memory traffic. Uh, which, uh, in another, another way to say that is that the, um, the host registers are not very efficiently used. So, you know, for example, this, this block, the original program could contain a loop, but all, every time we go around the loop, we're going to flush everything back into memory every time. So that's not good. So we would like to do better. And the approach of flushing everything back to memory at the end of a basic block is terribly naive by um, common standards of building these kinds of things. So what we would really like to do is hold some registers, uh, some values of the guest registers in, whole, in, the, in the host's registers as we tran go across basic block boundaries. But that's actually not so simple to do. There's a couple of problems. One of the problems is that there's many, even on the same architecture, like you know, ARM to ARM or x86 to x86, there are many more values um, to be held in the host registers than we actually have host registers for. That's because when we're running instrumented code, um, we are not only dealing with the original values, but we're also dealing with shadow values, of those values which track the definedness of the registers. And um, if we're running with origin tracking in memcheck, then there's another set of shadow values which show, tell you where um, any undefined values got um, created originally. So there's a lot of, a lot of registers potential values. So we need to decide on a mapping. And for example, one way we could do a mapping is to say, when we get to the end of a block and, and we discover that there's, there's, there's no translation for the next block, then when we make the next block translation, then we just start allocating registers here based on the binding, based on the mapping that we had at this point so that you can just jump across here without having to shuffle any registers around. Um, so that, that's a, a, a pretty standard technique in the literature. Um, unfortunately, it's, even that's not simple because you wind up in the following situation. If, if this is a loop and we translate this first and then we translate that, then there's no rearrangement of registers across this edge because we just inherited the mapping from this block. But when we jump back on the loop back edge to start the, the, start the block again, then we have to rearrange to um, match the mapping here, which is going to be different from there. So what we actually want is to have the compensation code here, because that's used done once. And that's just the compensation code on the back edge to be, uh, to be non-existent. So um, I think this is probably a problem that's solved in the literature, uh, but I haven't looked into it um, in that much detail. I'm, I am assuming it's fixable. So I wanted to talk about a different problem, which is um, kind of important as well. It's the precise exceptions problem. So if we return to our a little ex running example, Originally here was a, a put 
IR statement which wrote the value of R1 back into the guest state. And we've removed that because we see that we're writing R1 further down, and so th this put is going to overwrite the value. So, well, that sounds good, right? But actually, if this load faults, then we are not going to be able to complete the simulating this instruction. And so we, we're going to have to leave the simulator and deliver a signal to the um, simulated application. And we do not have a up-to-date value of R1 at this point. So mostly that doesn't matter because most um, user space code does not catch signals and then try and restart instructions. Um, it's a you know, terribly unportable thing to do. But there are some people who remain, shall remain nameless who um, have a JIT in the middle of Firefox, for example, which actually does want to do this stuff. And so when, it, when it's important, then it's, you have to do it right. Otherwise, you are going to end up entering the signal handlers with out-of-date registers, and then the simulation will quickly crash after that, I, I think. So what are we going to do about precise exceptions? Well, at the moment, we have a terrible kludge, which is um, we're going to disable this, trend, this um, optimization, the redundant put removal, um, in the cases where it's actually a problem. So this is, um, I, sorry to say, a Mozilla-specific hack. And uh, you didn't know that, right? <laughs> um, but that's not really a good solution in the long run. It just makes the performance even worse. So the, the more, more general solution is to um, create some kind of table when you're creating these translations, which tells you where every value is, whether it's in the guest or the up, where the value of every register is. It's either in the guest state or it's in some host register, or maybe it can be computed by doing the following you know, magic recipe. Um, you need to be careful that you actually don't remove computations, the value that compute, computes any particular register, because then you can't restore it ever. We also need to be very careful about um, sequencing effects when you translate into the intermediate representation. So if we have an instruction which uh, is going to has it read from memory and update a register, then we need to put the read from memory first and the register update IR second, because we don't want to update the register first and then have the um, load, the memory operation faulting, failing, because then we can't back out. So you have to be very simple, very careful about this. Um, the program count is actually very um, important and, and important case. So in Valgrind, we go to great, great trouble to maintain the program counter up to date all the time. Because, for example, in, vet, in memcheck, if a memory instruction um, is determined to um, access invalid memory, then we will want to give an error message to the user. So we're going to have to unwind the stack at that point. And in order to do that, we need the up-to-date program counter and also up-to-date stack pointer. So that's another source of a large amount of memory traffic. And it's, it's completely stupid, because actually what you really want to do is calculate the simulated program counter from the program counter of the generated instrumented code by having yet another table that does this. So that's something we could do better. Um, this is something that is difficult to do in a portable way because it requires recovering the host program counter when you're in, inside some C helper call. It, it's all horrible. This is the kind of problem you have to do. This, this kind of stuff is easier to do in a single, uh, um, single architecture simulator like PIN or Dynamo Rio. But doing this in um, a framework where you're trying to support ARM and x86 and MIPS and you know whatever else is actually a problem. So I think that's all about precise exceptions I wanted to say.
So I want to move to um, talk a bit about um, some proposals, how to move forwards. What can we do to um, improve performance? So we talked a bit about um, imp improving the use of registers. I won't go, go over that. Uh, in, in dynamic instrumentation and dynamic compilation systems, in general, there's basically two tricks you could do. One is to um, deal with larger pieces of code. So here we are dealing with very small um, blocks of machine code, like 8, 10, 12 instructions on average, really not very much, even though VEX does try and um, follow branches through the machine code wh when it can. Um, another thing that we want to do is um, be more flexible about um, doing if-then-else in the intermediate representation. So currently the intermediate representation is uh, kind of kludged so that we never have to deal with the case that there's two control flow paths that come together. This, this complicates register allocation, it complicates um, the uh, optimization of it. Yeah, so longer, block, longer blocks helps. But having uh, longer blocks is not something that the JIT can do by itself. This is something that the um, runtime system that surrounds the JIT and, and um, controls it needs to help with. And in particular, we want to do maybe a more traditional two-speed um, just-in-time compiler. So the traditional thing would be, for example, to, to do a l not very optimized translation of, a, of each block as we come across it and add instrumentation to it to see how often um, it's executed. And in particular, what, what happens at the, the um, conditional branches that are at the end of most blocks. So we, we're going to have a cold block cache and profiling. And after the blocks, um, you know, after we see some sequence of blocks which have been executed um, enough times to be hot, then we're going to um, assemble a hot path into, you know, you know, jam them together into a hot path and re-optimize for that particular hot path. It, this is some um, standard stuff if you know about trace compilation systems. So there's various um, select algorithms that allow you to decide um, which of the paths through this uh, set of cold blocks is the best. So uh, that's something I actually don't want to do directly like this because I don't really like the idea of having a distinction between blocks which are cold and blocks which are hot and having to decide at some point I'm going to have to make this, um, distinct, this transition between them. What I'd rather do is have a single unified cache of blocks and then profile at the end of each trace um, to see which way we're going out of it if it's a conditional branch. And we can um, incrementally um, extend the, the trace one block at a time as, as we see how it goes. So we can possibly generate better code by, us um, by using the runtime profiling. Um, but we could also um, use this to reduce JIT overheads as well because what you can do, I think this is also now pretty much a standard trick, is um, you can run your cold blocks or your less optimized um, trace while you have in a different thread the compiler optimizing a longer version or a better version of the same trace. And so you don't have to wait for that to finish before you can execute it. And when that's finally finished, you can bring it into your um, code cache and run that instead. So um, basically moving compilation into a helper thread gets rid of the latency. Sounds like a cool trick. I've never actually tried to do it. So the other th way which I really like to um, ad readjust this is to make it possible to do um, speculation in the um, intermediate representation. Um, and this is again another um, trick which is standard for JavaScript compilers, for Java compilers, anything that does um, dynamic compilation really, um, other dynamic instrumentation frameworks. What it means is that we do not try and make one translation of these, this code for um, all 
all conditions, but we rather decide that we're going to specialize on some assumption about the, um, the block which um, will help us generate faster code. And then at the start of the block, we're going to ins insert a check which actually decides whether this assumption is true. And if it's not, then we're going to have to find some other way to execute it by jumping, jumping out elsewhere. So there's a particular reason I want to do this, which is for memcheck. And it's, I want to um, see if it's possible to get any use out of the idea that memory, many memory references um, are at fixed, small fixed offsets for, from each other. So you know, if we're, we're accessing um, a C++ object, then we're going to have some accesses which are you know, very close by and the fixed known offset or if we have an unrolled loop, then maybe we can see multiple fixed um, offsets from a base register. And I want to try and see if it's possible to uh, amortize the cost of doing um, implementing the shadow memory mapping using that kind of um, technique. But in order to do that, um, you need to have a framework where you can um, represent these, this speculation. Um, there's, there's a bunch of other stuff that you could speculate on, like the, the data that you're loading and storing in memcheck is completely defined. That would allow you to cut, or completely undefined, that would allow you to cut some of the um, special case paths off and uh, move them into C helper calls. Or on the x87 simulation, you have all this nasty stuff with the register stack, and you need to, you know, it's never actually going to underflow or overflow because that would be a compiler bug, but you still need to handle that case. So the, tr the tr traditional way to do speculation is you, ha you generate code which checks your assumption, and if it doesn't hold, then you go, and go off to some less optimized translation, otherwise, you go on the fast path. And you can do that, but I want to, would like to avoid um, a kind of a code explosion. So already when we're running big applications, you have hundreds of megabytes, literally hundreds of megabytes of instrumented code. And um, I believe that the performance of Memcheck and Valgrind is largely limited, or to some extent limited by iCache misses in, in this code. Um, it's also kind of inflexible because what I'd really like to do is to say, I want to speculate around just this, p this small part of one trace, and then I want to rejoin and continue on the trace later. So what I've been thinking about for some months is um, a proposal where we have um, basically control flow diamonds. So we no longer have just straight line code. But instead, we can do if, you know, if, and then, then and else, and then come back together, and then we can continue in a straight line, and then do another if, then, else kind of thing. So we make our side exits unconditional now. This is a change. And we have some flexibility. So we can say, we're going to speculate, but <coughs> we stay on the trace. So we, we can have a control flow diamond which cut, goes apart and then comes back together. Or we can speculate and leave the trace, if you really want to do that, by putting a, you know, your unconditional exit in one of the branches. And um, the, presumably, we, we will have the JIT term to, to understand that uh, one of the branches is never going to continue, so the other one is the hot branch. So we can do some kind of transformations, maybe. For example, uh, something that occurs quite often in the existing VEX framework is that you have to p generate a piece of in IR, which I've written just X here, and then it's followed by a side exit, which is almost never taken. For example, that would be an alignment uh, check failure or something like this, or um, uh, a check for self-modifying code failure. And we have to do this even though it's only relevant on the very occasional time where we exit. So what I'd like to do is to, to move this code off trace basically into the, the cold, cold side. And so it's no, no longer on hot path. And there's no way to do that in the IR at the moment. Um, but this would um, make it possible to do that. 
Um, and uh, for example, in order to support the kind of games I'd like to try and play about um, dealing with multiple memory references together, um, we would need some kind of transformation like this, where you have you merging two two control flow diamonds into one bigger diamond by taking this x and putting it, you know, putting it both there and there, if you like, and then um, you can maybe optimize both sides. So I'm really curious to know how much, um, you know, how much mileage you can get out of this. Um, one thing about VEX or the IR that has been very apparent is that it, the intermediate representation has clean semantics and it allows really good optimization of this straight line piece of code um, even now, particularly for example when dealing with ARM code where you get a lot of complex stuff dealing with thumb conditionalization. So clean semantics counts and um, I want to maintain that here. Where it's, for example, unclear whether you can reorder, unclear what the side effects are, so it's unclear when, when a particular IR statement is dead and you can get rid of it, or it's unclear when you can reorder stuff. Yeah, that's not a good answer, I know. So I'm, I'm nearly done. I have just really one more slide to say, what would that actually entail? So this takes us one step closer to um, real, having real SSA. What, what it doesn't do is to give us loops in the IR. So, so having loops in um, SSA brings you the complexity of having to compute um, dominance frontiers. And th that's a, a kind of a complexity and expense I really don't want to have in the JIT. But you know, it might be OK to have these control flow diamonds, because that just gives us the problem of having phi nodes, which is really not so complicated. Um, this uh, phi node is the SSA uh, notation for dealing with values that flow together because of, um, well, in a, in a control flow graph. So then we would have to redo the IR optimizer for that. We'd have to redo the instruction selectors. And then we'd have to sort of mess around with the assemblers to try so that um, we place all the hot blocks together uh, at the start of the translation and all the cold blocks further, further down, the, the kind of games that GCC does with code layout at the moment. So the really last thing is, this, these kinds of games with the IR are actually independent of the stuff I was talking about for building longer traces. You can do one or the other. Um, they're, they're independent. But um, building longer traces will uh, give the, this, the, you know, this improved IR optimization, uh, I think, more scope to be effective. So they really kind of need to go together. Um, and that's really all, this kind of summary. So I talked a bit about VEX, a bit about registers, and a bit about a new framework. Um, there's a big question about, well, it all sounds like a you know, great fun hack that we could soak up the next <coughs> two or three years doing. I have no idea if it's actually worth doing, um, and I don't really know how to find out either. Uh, and I have no idea how we would do it. <laughs> So thank you. If there are any questions. Yeah. You, you can ask questions now if you like. Yeah. Uh, for the exception uh, case where you uh, remove the deep uh, and you had to edit back for when, when I remove when we remove the what sorry as a put statement yeah uh, so you basically you see an exception and uh, you uh, resume the execution as a put statement so you have to keep the state of what's a register for already 
Well, it's, 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 this is not a question for the JIT. You see an exception, and then the way, you, if you were running it on a, you know, natively, what would happen is that the kernel would deliver a signal to the application saying, y y this instruction faulted, and here is, here's the registers, the um, context. So Valgrin has to do exactly the same. What, what the application wants to do after that is its, its own question. My question is, uh, Will you resume uh, the state to a previous uh, to a previous point in the history and just replace in the original insertion without optimizing, without optimizing uh, the good insertion? So, so the proposal is to basically to each point you will uh, provide a way to unwind to what was the state before. But there's only some things you can unwind. So you can unwind. Um, Right. So you can, in particular, it's hard to unwind um, register um, writes to memory because that would imply that you'd have to <coughs> read them first. So that, I don't think that's feasible. So you need to make sure that if you have a memory exception, that is the first thing that happens. It's pretty tricky. Why uh, not, uh, as an alternative to generate a better code, uh, uh, try to connect the IR to an LLVM backend or GCC lib backend? Well, one, one reason is those things are massive and com really complex. Uh, uh, but this has been tried before. Some people tried it with QMU. Um, the, another thing is that those, they are tu generally tuned to produce good code, um, but not be very fast about it, whereas this also needs to be fast. Uh, it doesn't need to be fast if you're trying to work out if it's worth spending the years to do it properly. Say that again, sorry? Um, you can do uh, like whether finite is worth supporting or not. Yeah. You do by converting into LLVMs IR and run its bank very slow optimizations. Yeah. Then convert back yeah. and see if the machine code you're running is dramatically quicker. Oh, so this would be just as a. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, it also, the so we could use one of those alternative backends, but also the business about um, actually doing precise exceptions and generating the side tables kind of concerns me, and I think that would be um, a significant complication that we'd have to deal with regardless of what backend we used. So I was wondering, uh, you were talking about um, keeping allocated registers alive across multiple blocks, and I've actually uh, implemented something similar before, which actually uses um, the hot, hot and cold blocks to try and determine which register bindings are, mo are most likely to be useful. Yeah. It might be something interesting to try. Okay. So this is a hint that this person knows something yeah, I can steal your ideas. Feel free. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you.